Hello, this is Jack Jackson back with our second video here talking about um, hypothesis testing. In our last video, hopefully you've already seen that one, uh, we established the basic idea of a hypothesis test. So in this section, where we'll be working through the steps to actually perform a test of hypothesis, specifically we will be examining a one-sample z-test using the classical critical value method. After studying this, you should be able to work uh, some homework problems. So there are two sort of basic methods or approaches for hypothesis testing. Uh, the classical critical value method and the p-value method. I'll do talk about this video, the classical critical value method and the p-value method in the next video. And the critical value method, we compare x-bar values uh, to other x-bar values or z-scores to z-scores. So what we'll end up doing is computing boundary values uh, A and B or lower critical value and upper critical value, which are sample mean values corresponding to a probability of alpha and compare it to the measured x-bar value, the sample mean or its z-score for the sample. So we end up comparing x-bar to x-bar or z to z. In the next video, we'll talk about the p-value method, which is actually a little better, I think, uh, to compare probabilities. So these are comparing probabilities to probabilities, or if you want to think of them as areas under the PDF graph. So here we're computing the probability area under the PDF corresponding to the measured sample mean and compare it to alpha. So we end up comparing probability to probability, that is a p-value to alpha. So we'll talk about that one in the next video. We're going to elaborate on this first one in this video. So let's do an example here. I'm going to use the same example for the next this video and next. So let's take a manufacturing example uh, to start with. We have a one sample uh, two-tailed z-test is what we're going to show you here. So we're making pistons with the known historical data. Let's say we have a good history and we know that the, the uh, diameter of the pistons is distributed normally with a mean of 4.25 and a standard deviation of 0.12. That's for the distribution of individual piston diameters. Now, we take a sample of size 16 and we find the mean is 4.31 centimeters for the diameter. Now, notice that 4.31 is bigger than 4.25. Well, certainly, there's some evidence that that mean is bigger than before. But wait a minute, is that is that just because we have some normal changing from time to time? We wouldn't expect the mean of our sample to be exactly 4.25 every time. Maybe that's just because there's some normal fluctuation. Or is it because that something's wrong with our machine, assuming it was right before, and centered at 4.25, maybe something's wrong with our machine and we're now producing bigger pistons than before. We need to do something about that. We need to maybe stop the machine, see what's wrong. Maybe it's maybe something's broken on it. Maybe it's been miscalibrated. Maybe uh, something's come out of, uh, somebody's turned a knob the wrong way. If that's the problem, we need to stop it. Well, wait a minute. This is an important decision. We've got to decide, do we stop this thing and fix it? Or... Is it there's not a problem to fix? Which is it? we got to decide that. So that's what we're trying to do. So let's summarize what we know so far. We're making pistons with known historical data. The random variable x is the diameter of an individual piston. The basic assumption is that x is distributed normally with a standard deviation of 0.12 centimeters. The null hypothesis, h sub 0, is that mu is 4.25 centimeters. Actually, the null hypothesis is more than that. It's actually that we have a distribution of x values, or at least x bar values, that we know, which is normal, and that the mean is 4.25, and that the standard deviation is 0.12 centimeters. Really, all of that is part of the, norm, the null hypothesis, because that's what we're going to be using to do our, as our assumption for producing some probability values or inverse probability values. But in any event, it's usually just written as what mu is. 
The alternative hypothesis is that H1, or HA, is called the alternative hypothesis, and that says mu is not equal to 4.25. Now, there's different kinds of alternative hypothesis. This one, uh, not equal to, is will lead to what we call a two-tailed uh, uh, alternative hypothesis. If it's less than, it'll be left-tailed. Greater than, it'll be right-tailed. We'll talk about those some examples later. So then we had, went out and took a sample. We found the sample mean, which is something we actually measured and computed to be 4.31, and the sample size is 16. And we need to establish a level of significance, alpha, and let's suppose that this alpha level is 0.1. What is that saying? It's saying we are comfortable with making a type 1 error 10% of the time but we're not comfortable in making it more often than that. So the value of alpha will typically be given in a homework problem. However, in actual practice, the researcher must pick the level of alpha, uh, or they have, or one will be picked for them by some sort of industry standard. Note that the alpha can be any small value, but 0 0.1, 0 0.05, or 0 0.01 are often typical choices. So according to our null hypothesis, this is the distribution of individuals. Mean of 4.25, standard deviation of 0.12. So our individuals are normal. That we recall in order to use a z-test, it is not necessary for the distribution of individuals to be normal, but it's required that the distribution of sample means be at least, at least approximated well by a normal distribution. In this example, we were told that the distribution of individual diameters is normal with mean mu equals 4.25 and Standard deviation sigma equals 0 0.12. Here's the graph of the distribution of individual diameters. But the distribution of sample means then is also normal but has a smaller standard deviation. So the distribution of individuals is this black graph which is shorter, fatter, more spread out. The more tightly packed smaller standard deviation graph with the same center but smaller standard deviation is the distribution of sample means, the distribution of the X bar values. Uh, that's the, the red graph here, the taller, skinnier one. It, the, dis, the, the center is the same, okay? It will be, um, be centered up there, but the standard deviation is smaller. Specifically, the standard deviation of the X bar values is the standard deviation of the individuals, X, divided by the square root of the sample size, N. So in our case, that's 0.12 divided by square root of 16. That works out to be 0.03. Of course, you can probably tell this is a, a, a book problem or, or generated problem because you know all the numbers come out to be really nice without long decimals here. So um, if the null hypothesis is true, then this graph has the PDFs for both the distribution of individual values, values the solid black curve, and the distribution of sample means, the dotted red curve. Since the individuals were distributed normally, this distribution of sample means is also distributed normally. Both of these distributions will have the same center, the same mean, 4.25, but the distribution of sample means has a smaller standard deviation. So what we're going to do is take the red graph here, discard the black one. We're going to look at the distribution of sample means kind of just like we did for a Z interval in a previous video, and we're going to look at that. And so we're going to kind of take that red one and zoom in on it, discard the black one. And what was the red graph here is now the blue graph here. And here is the X bar value we got. Now it's not right here real close to the mean, so we, we can't obviously say that that's um, probably from this, but neither is it far away out the side. We need some number to tell us if this is if this is sufficiently far from that mean uh, to be uh, is is the machine actually producing bigger pistons? That's what we want to know. So this graph is the graph of the distribution of sample means, the dotted red graph from the previous slide. We mark the location of the sample mean on the distribution. Clearly, this is higher than the hypothesized mean of 4.25. But why is this? It could be that this sample comes from the hypothesized population, and we just got a sample with a somewhat unusually large mean. However, it could also be that this sample really didn't come from the hypothesized population. The population could have changed over time, 
or could otherwise be miscalibrated, maybe the machine, or uh, there's something different about the sample that makes it come from a different population. In the context of this problem, this would be the case if something in the manufacturing process has changed to start making items with larger diameters. Assuming that the process was on average producing correctly sized diameters before, this would indicate that we need to stop the process, fix the problem. However, it could also be true there's no problem since the sample is just a bit larger than normal because of normal causes of value variation. Which is it? We don't want to take time expense to shut the machine and try to fix something we really can't fix that wasn't broken to begin with. On the other hand, if it is messed up, we need to fix it. How do we quantify this decision? That's what we're trying to figure out. So this is the same graph again. Okay, so the alternative hypothesis mu is not equal to mu naught, so this is what we call a two-tailed test. In the statist test statistic method, which is the classical way of doing it, uh, we want to be uh, we want to take the alpha 0.1 and split it in two equal pieces, alpha over 2, which is 0 0.05. We want that 0 0.05 essentially to be in the two tails, in the left tail and the right tail. So we want to produce critical x values, say a lower critical value, cv sub l, and an upper critical value, cv sub u, so that alpha over 2 is the probability below the lower critical value, and it's also the probability above the upper critical value. Well, if we want to find the the probability um, with the x value that goes with that, we're just doing an inverse norm. So we're doing an inverse norm of 0 0.05 with that mean of 4.25 and standard deviation of 0 0.03. By the way, notice that's the standard deviation of the x bar values. That's the sigma divided by the square root of n, not the just the sigma. It's the sigma of the x bars. And that gives us an inverse norm, which gives us an x value of about 4.2. So if it's to the left of 4.2 for x bar, then that happens with probability 5%. Then similarly, we, we need to find the x bar value, uh, x value, so that so the alpha over 2 is the probability to the right. So that is 0 0.05, 5%. Well, if there's 5% to the right, there's 95% to the left. Remember, an inverse norm, you always put in the probability to the left. So that's an inverse norm of 0.95 with that mean, and again, the standard deviation of the x bar values, let's say that's about 4.3. So now we have two critical values. I can illustrate that on the graph. The, the left critical value we got was about 4.2. It was about 4.3 for the upper one. And if we shade in the area to the right of the upper one, and to the left of the lower one, we get this red shaded area, which is a two-tailed area. Well, if the, if the null hypothesis is true, the probability that we would get something in the red area is alpha, 10%. Well, in fact, we did get something in that. So we would say that's strong enough evidence to say, beyond a reasonable doubt, that this came from a different population. In our, in, in our context of our problem, was it saying, hey, something's changed on this process. Hey, we better stop this assembly line and go back and find out why are we making, uh, looks like, bigger pistons in this case. So once again, we find these critical values. Now this one here is done on the actual original distribution of the X bar values. What's more typically done is to normalize or standardize this so that we're looking at the distribution of z-scores. That is, we're looking at a standard normal. So if x bar is distributed normally, then the z-score, x bar minus mu over the sigma of the x bars, or in other words, x bar minus mu over sigma divided by square root of n, that is a normal with a mean of zero and standard deviation of one, in other words, a standard normal or a z-score. Since a standard normal is a distribution of z-scores, sometimes I call it a z-distribution. So in this case, if we look at finding x-bar values with a hypothesized mean population of 4.25 and a standard deviation of the x-bar values, sigma of x divided by square root of n was 0.03, 
If we did this over and over again, we would get X bar values that were distributed normally. And the Z scores then would be distributed uh, with the standard normal. Okay, if the null hypothesis is true. So we would get a graph that looks like this. Well, of course, that graph basically looks like this graph that we had. Okay, but now the critical regions are just found on a standard normal. And they're just inverse norms, but this time from a standard normal. So inverse norm of 0 0.0501 is this one, negative 1 1.64. And inverse norm of 0 0.9501 gives us this other one about positive 1 1.64. Since we want these evenly spaced on both sides, and this is a symmetric about the mean, and the mean is 0, then if you get 1, then you get the other one is the opposite sign. So just do one of these and flip the sign, and you got the other one. But in any event, this will put 5% in the lower tail, 5% in the upper tail, for a total of alpha equals 10%, 0.1, in the two tails together. That's what we call our critical region. Now, to compare to that, we need to find a z-score of our test statistic, uh, or z-score of our x-bar value, and the z-score there is called our test statistic, which is called z-star, or z-asterisk. So Z star is our sample mean, 4.31, minus the hypothesized population mean, 4.25, divided by the standard deviation of the X bars, which is sigma divided by square root of N, which is 0 0.03. We work that out. It turns out to be 2. Well, 2 is out here for a Z star, and that is greater than 1.64. Look how much that picture looks like the picture that we had right here. Either way, the, uh, either way we do it, comparing an X bar to an X value or Z star to a Z score, then we are comparing a test statistic to a critical region. We're comparing basically, well, in this case, Z score to Z score. And we would say we would have enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis. So if, it is, if your test statistic is higher than the upper limit on your on your z-score, then you're in this red critical region on the right tail. If it's two-tailed, we could also have the possibility that the z-star might have been down here below this lower critical value. So these, these limits, these air, uh, edges of these critical regions are called the critical values. In a two-tailed test, you have a lower and an upper one. So if, the critical if your test statistic is above the upper critical value or below the lower critical value, you are in the red region. That is the reject null hypothesis region. If the, the Z star had been in this middle region in the middle, that would be in our do not reject region. So here we do have enough evidence to show that it's most likely the, the uh, machine is producing bigger pistons now. So we compare Z star to the critical values of 1.64 and negative 1.64. Notice in this case that Z star equals 2 is in the critical region, red region, since it is higher than the critical value, the upper critical value of 1.64. Notice that we are comparing two Z scores, one Z star corresponding to the mean of the data from the sample and the other critical value corresponding to a region, or in this case two regions, with a combined probability area under the PDF, red shaded region that's equal to our desired value for alpha. Since Z star is in the critical region, we interpret this as enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative hypothesis. So there is enough evidence to conclude that the sample does not come from a distribution with the hypothesized mean. In this context, we should stop the manufacturing process, find out why we're making bigger pistons, and get this problem fixed. In the next video, we'll see how to do the p-value method which personally I think is a little better than the classical method.